Good morning. I'm Michael Bloom, Hedge Vice President. Thank you very much for joining us today on our webcast, America at a Crossroads. I'm here today with Hedge Eye's macroeconomic uh, and policy uh, managing director based out of Washington, D.C., J.T. Taylor, and of course, the head of our demography research, Neil Howe, famed historian and author of The Fourth Turning and last year's blockbuster follow-on book, The Fourth Turning is Here. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Good to be with you, Michael. We are, we are going to talk about... Uh, what's been going on in the political landscape here in the United States as it relates to the uh, presidential race. We're about three and a half months away from the election. Uh, I like to start with history and to try to put things in context to understand the baseline. Uh, the number of times, guys, in the last eight years that the three of us have picked up the phone and called each other and said, I can't believe what just happened. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen in politics. Uh, I think I'd be a billionaire if I got a dollar for each one of those calls. And now here we are in the middle of July 2024. We have uh, two of the oldest men ever running against one another in this country for president. We have one party seemingly in open revolt against uh, the sitting president uh, who has been nominated to run again because of his age. And we are just a few days uh, past an assassination attempt on uh, his opponent, which for the whiff of uh, wind could have led this to be a completely different conversation and uh, even more unprecedented. Uh, Neil, I want to start with you in the context of the fourth turning. Wh how am I supposed to find a baseline to orient myself like where we are? Th this is just completely crazy. And it seems that the script is getting crazier and crazier. Yeah, I I, uh, I I think that's right. Uh, this seems to be a conversation we've had ever since uh, 2016. Uh, is the the growing, uh, uh, growing uh, polarization of of the sort of the two tribes in America? You know, red zone, blue zone. Uh, how it's beginning to define our political life, and increasingly in almost uh, Manichaean terms, uh, Michael. <laughs> In the sense that uh, what we see politically is driven by 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 fear of the other side taking power, you know, and and we've just seen the rhetoric of the last two months, both sides saying this: if the other side takes power, there will never be another election. Right? <laughs> Democracy will come to an end. Uh, the, uh, there will be rivers of blood. There will be, you know, I mean, you go on and on. Uh, New Republic just had a. Um, uh, a cover uh, image with uh, uh, a poster for for Hitler, you know, with with Trump's face put on it. But you understand what I mean? That this has become, uh, and this is why uh, there is very little movement in the polls, except for people in the middle. I think that's what people should understand. Uh, two thirds of all voters say there's absolutely nothing that would change their mind. Um, and most of the rest said there's not much that would change their mind. You basically have 10% who would be open to persuasion. And, and among the most likely voters, that's probably smaller, right? That's maybe 6 or 7%. Uh, so all of that motion. So a lot of it is getting out your base, uh, making sure that people come out. And it's all suffused with this image of Armageddon and violence, uh, meaning that if the wrong side wins... Uh, it's all over for America. Um, and and I think there's a lot of worry in America about the increasing imagery of violence and dead ends, you know, for our democracy. Um, uh, PBS Maris poll actually just came out was, uh, a couple of days ago and uh, came to the interesting finding, uh, maybe alarming, uh, that 20 percent of Americans agree that violence may be necessary to get America back on track. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, younger people were especially likely uh, to believe that um, uh, this is 42 percent of Americans under age 30, uh, 14 percent uh, strongly agreed with that. Um, you can imagine being a young person in America and looking up and just seeing nothing but this your entire political life and thinking this is where we're going. Um, 
it, it may be in some sense where we're going. Michael, you're familiar with my book. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's where we are. This is, has to be seen in the context of, of the fourth turning. You have two different parties representing very different agendas, mutually exclusive agendas for America's future. Um, one of them will come out on top. One of them will adjust to that. And we will come out a very different country in the end of it. Uh, and I know that JT is going to say something about that. Obviously, with all that we've seen, we saw the debate, uh, which I think everyone agreed that that Biden performed very poorly at, quickly followed by this assassination attempt, quickly followed by the GOP convention and the choice of the vice president. And I, I suppose one thing we want to do is just take a look at uh, how that's changing the political fortunes of the two parties at the moment. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, dig into that, JT. I mean, you obviously have been entrenched in Washington for much of your career. And, and a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the experience that you have being part of a presidential campaign. But are there any moderates left uh, in uh, Congress? And when you talk to them, what do you hear from them? Yeah, you know, there there are moderates left and they, it just and in both parties. And I actually talked to an office this morning uh, on the uh, Republican side of the aisle, they really, I, I don't believe they're attending the convention, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it just, they feel like they're outcasts or outliers right now. And they're just alone or lone voices in the wilderness. And so the extremes, um, or maybe now the, uh, I don't know if you want to call them the extremes, but the 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 most vocal elements of the parties um, are are dominating right now. And uh, and they're not really leaving room for the moderates. And you know, I, I, I suspect that there's a larger chunk there. But what I've really come to realize here over the past, well, not just nine years, but especially the last nine months to a year, is that this it's about power, Michael and, and Neil. I mean, it, 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 these people want to remain in power. And if it means becoming a chameleon uh, for a, a period of time to get reelected, is you know I used to think that there and there still are noble politicians here uh, in Washington and across the country. I used to think that there were more of them, but it just feels to me again on both sides of the aisle that the the, the goal is to get reelected right now. And if you have to conform to whatever movement the, your party is taking, then you're going to conform to get reelected. I I, I totally agree, Jaitane. One one thing that strikes me is when you talk to individual congressmen. It's amazing how many moderates they are. Yep. But when it comes to voting, when it comes to their public stance, they have no choice. They have to band together because it's like an on-off switch. They either all win or they all lose. Um, and and uh, so they're 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 pulled yep. uh, very often against their will. And at some point, Neil, we have to do a, a segment on the third party. But I just want to get to, to Neil's point, Michael, because it's relevant here on these undecideds and pulling these undecideds, it doesn't look as if there's a ton of movement there just yet, right? I suspect that uh, we'll see some, um, it's still early days. The assassination was only what, three days ago. You always get a convention bounce. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Neil, I think Reagan, after his assassination attempt, his approval went up 8%. I don't think that's gonna happen here. Uh, I think he's going to see a bounce, but again, this country is, is is very very closely divided. It's polarized, as polarized as it's ever going to be. And I'm I'm going to be curious to see where the polls, again, Michael. I know we're going to get into that a little later. Are headed uh, once we get through this. Con once we get through the you know assassination cycle, and once we get through this news cycle and the convention, which by the way we'll get to in a second, looks as if this is going to be the most unified Republican Party I've seen for the most part in in recent memory. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get into uh, those topics. I, I do want to stay on the fourth turning uh, for just another minute, because one of the hallmarks of the fourth turning is a weakening of institutions. And I see, think we've seen this, you know, as it relates to the Supreme Court, we've seen this to uh, a degree, a large degree, actually, I think, as it relates to the Department of Justice and allegations that have been going on for, for many years about the politicization of that. I, I'm shocked that now we're seeing this as it relates to the Secret Service. And I do think that this is a, a very scary and very dangerous environment because uh, the principal, the president, is, you know, by our Constitution, 
really uh, a, a not just the head of state, but but an, an almighty element of our society. If we're starting to tear down the institution of the Secret Service, like how far into the fourth turning are we? And how does this evolve your thinking that you've laid out in the book, Neil, as to how uh, there's a denouement here? It, how does this all play out? Uh, your question about the Secret Service is interesting. Uh, uh, everyone, I think, is pointing to enormous failure, right? I mean, how is this guy... <laughs> climbed to the top of the building right next to the venue. Uh, it seems unthinkable. Uh, uh, obviously, questions are going to be raised. Uh, the, uh, the head of the Secret Service, she's going to be grilled before Congress. Um, uh, but again, uh, think of it in terms of the context that which is posed, right? Uh, if we lose, we'll never get another election. I mean, again, you you come back to this again and again. It's sort of an all or nothing point. Uh, the final battle, as as Trump likes to say in his rallies, this is the final battle. You know it. I know. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a little bit. It, it's not quite a revival. It's almost uh, you're a, you're at the you're at you're you're at, at the Battle of Stalingrad or something, right? And. Uh, all institutions become pulled and trained uh, to to you know make sure your side wins. Uh, I I think that this is actually going to be a case uh, that's going to be a little bit like the Reichstag fire. Uh, you remember that was the uh, the excuse that Hitler had for taking over the 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 you know emergency powers after he was made chancellor and everyone had conspiracy theories about that right the communists set it up no the, the nazis did it so that they could get after the common it turned out in the end michael as you probably know it turned out to be some poor lonely uh dutch bricklayer immigrant who almost undoubtedly acted alone <laughs> <laughs> you know how reality always disappoints us you know and 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 i think that this is another case uh this was a um uh a a lonely isolated you know 20 year old uh who god knows what went through his mind but you saw those statistics i just related as to young people thinking that violence will be necessary right um, and I actually looked that up. If you think that the number of young people under age 30 who think that, uh, who who uh, uh, strongly agree that violence will be necessary, uh, that works out to seven or seven million uh, Americans under age 30, right? Um, so in other words, are you really surprised? Now, I, I just want to add too, in the broader context of American history, assassinations and assassination attempts uh, are not uncommon. You mm. probably know, uh, Michael, this is a violent country. Um, JT, I don't know if you remember Rat Brown. He used to say that violence is American as cherry pie. Uh, Rat Brown was a radical back in the 1960s. Um, but about one out of every four presidents has had either been assassinated or has a serious assassination attempt against him. Uh, that was true for... Uh, for Truman, uh, during his presidency, he was chased from room to room by you know a group of Puerto Rican separatists who were trying to kill him. Uh, certainly, we had Kennedy. We had several assassination attempts against Nixon and Ford. We oh. obviously had one against Reagan. Interestingly enough, uh, I would say over the last several terms, we've been remarkably free of assassin. I mean, yep. JT. I mean, if I have to put it in historical terms, many people have been referring recently to. Um, to Teddy Roosevelt in yeah. that famous speech when he was in Bull Moose presidency in twenty uh, in 1912, uh, when he was actually hit by a bullet that I, I believe was deflected by a book, but he bled for an hour while continue insisting on delivering his speech, saying it takes more than a bullet to bring down a Bull Moose, as I recall. And I think about this, I mean, you, you, you just rock guys. guys. We, we've got Jackson McKinley, I mean, go oh, on. Jackson was a yeah. The the but the gun didn't go off, and Jackson personally went and grabbed the gun out of his hand. But this FDR. is this, yeah. this has historically and FDR, uh, and FDR was actually similar to this one in the sense that it was before he actually assumed the presidency. Um, and again, the 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 bullet someone hit 
hit the guy's hand. I, I believe that was Giuseppe Zangara. Uh, the, the someone hit his hand, and instead it killed Anton Chermak, who was the who was the mayor of Chicago. Um, and FDR was spared. But I just, guess I, my I, again, it's yeah. not exclusive to us. I mean, you're seeing we we see uh, assassination attempt in, in Slovakia. I yeah, mean, all across that. the world, uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe. I mean, it's it's not it, it, while it, it it feels like it's exclusive to the U.S. at times. Uh, we are now are seeing it more and more uh, around the globe. Um, so but, but unfortunate. It, all, all that said, we're a pretty violent country. We got a lot of guns and you can go back in British history, for example, how many assassination attempts or successes have there been? Well, very, very few. Right. So, um, but I, I just want to put that a little bit in perspective as to the uh, electoral impact of an assassination attempt. I just think it varies. Uh, uh, it was very positive for Reagan. I think we all remember that, those of us who remember it. Uh, but it, uh, I don't think it helped Truman at all, who did very poorly in 1950 and obviously, you know, wasn't there anymore in 52. Uh, I don't think it really helped Ford. <laughs> I don't think it really made any difference for for Nixon. Uh, and obviously, uh, Teddy Roosevelt lost his uh, bull moose effort to to have a third party uh, take hold. But um, uh, I I agree. Uh, uh, it's it's going to make a little bit of movement, not a lot in the polls. But the fact that you had such a terrible uh, debate performance, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, JT, but the but debate performance which was shocking to a lot of people. I know a lot of uh, Democrats just turned off their TV. They couldn't, you know, or turn, turned off their computer or whatever. Uh, they couldn't watch it any longer. Um, but again, if you're voting out of fear, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you would vote for, you remember uh, 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 President Wilson in his last year was virtually comatose, but you would vote for a comatose Biden and his staff rather than allow Trump to get in. I think that is would be the attitude of a lot of uh, 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 core Democratic voters. So it even that may not make that much of a difference. I, and I, I don't think it will. I do want to get back to just quickly on on. Um on what the assassination attempt does. I mean, it, it 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 absolutely galvanizes the Republican Party or the majority of the Republican Party. Still think you have never Trumpers there. If you were a a lukewarm Republican who's still going to cast a vote and might not be excited with Trump, I do think the events over the weekend get you to the polls. Uh, so I do believe that it is going to have a net, very positive effect on the race. I think you're seeing that in some of the polling right now, not across the board, but some of the polling right now. And um, uh, and it's going to give Trump some momentum. It changes. The other thing it does before we get to, to Biden, it changes or is changing the complexion of the convention right now. And they're trying to stay positive. Apparently, Trump's speech is taking a 180 degree turn from just going. He said was going to go hard after Biden. And now he is going to preach unity. So if he can sustain this, by the way, this is a much more disciplined Trump than we've seen in nine years. And you saw that in the silence after the debate, which we'll get to again in a second. And then um, in sort of this turn over the past week and since the assassination, and it does, look, it does change people. Uh, and, and, and God forbid any of us should have to go through that. And so maybe he will make the pivot we've all been looking for for nine years and, and he continue to galvanize the party, uh, continue to galvanize their message uh, and it just sort of make them in, in untouchable going into the fall. On the debate side of things, I mean, the, 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 it's still two two points. Everyone was pointing, we had talked about this before, but everyone was pointing to uh, Biden's State of the Union. I'm like, guys, you have to understand he's reading from a teleprompter, right? We've seen his cadence. We've seen him slowing. Uh, I don't think anyone realized how much and, you, you know, having been through debate prep for a vice presidential candidate before, yes, you can wear thin uh, on that candidate and just sort of pound uh, things into his or her head and, and, and weaken them going into that debate. Uh, the jet lag thing I don't buy, the cold thing I don't buy. He, he just did. He just wasn't on. And it's damaging. And again, people are that debate uh, performance is indelibly etched in people's mind. There's no going back. I don't care how many. Uh, interviews with 
but Lester Holt, George Stephanopoulos, how many rallies, people are not going to forget that debate performance. You can't yeah, paper I, over it. You can't do speech after speech after speech. Um, and it's it's a big I, problem I, for the Democrats if they don't change course. I, I agree with you, JT. And 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 I will say, you know, we, we've been near Washington, D.C. for a long time. And look, we were all talking about it back in 2020. You remember, uh, everyone was noticing that he was slowing down. Uh, he wasn't quite what he was. And people were wondering, is he going to last four years until now? We assumed that he would pass it on. He didn't. I think that was a terrible mistake for the Democrats. And then they started hiding him. You know, they didn't have him come out for many performances. Everything was very scripted. Um, and it was kind of survival for, you know, the White House team and staff. Um, I do I do agree with you that I think the momentum of events right now is pushing Trump in a good direction and pushing uh, Biden in a bad direction in the sense that Trump, as he's becoming more confident, is becoming a little less acerbic, right? A little less polarizing. Uh, I was talking about his discipline after the debate. I was amazed at his discipline during the debate. Yeah. He didn't say anything when Biden was talking. That was the best thing he could have done, right? Just absolutely say nothing, stay polite, uh, and then hammer his key points again and again, right? I mean, he was pretty disciplined and he had higher energy. I think the biggest thing about the the assassination attempt is that it it came on the heels of the debate and it accentuated the contrast and the vitality level, right? Uh, and I, I think that's that's what everyone is sort of thinking about in their minds right now. The image of Trump with his fist pump, right? Right after with a with a blood on his face on the one hand, and then and then a, a, a Biden sort of having trouble following the thread of the debate on the other. Th this is very favorable to the to the to the Republicans. And I do think that Trump now, by pulling back, knowing he has an edge, knowing he can pull back, remember that political leaders always move back to their core when they feel in trouble. Yep. And I think, so Biden is, uh, Trump is pulling back from his core. He feels he can afford to. Meanwhile, Biden is going to his core. Would you agree, JT? Recently, yeah. Biden is going to his core. He's now the the underdog. He's fighting the elite. You know, he's almost assuming a Trumpian persona, fighting all these uh, commentariat. You know, are all against him. Uh, I don't think that's going to work for him because he's always been the candidate of the of the the, the machine the center it, the, it, it, the, it, the will, it will not work for him uh, it will not work for him and biden i mean and trump i do believe he's got a different team around him uh, so you've got to give this new sort of troika in his orbit credit for the discipline during the, the debate after the debate i mean did you ever think michael or, or or neil that he would be silent for over a week after that debate i mean think about how much discipline it would take to get that man uh, I agree. Uh, to, to shut up for a week. Um, having I said, want to that talk a little bit about uh, about polls here, guys, uh, and, yeah. and move the conversation along there. But um, before we talk about the specific polls and, and what the important ones are to, to look at and, and races, et cetera, I want to talk about polling. And you know, there have obviously been a couple of, of uh, elections now where the pollsters have just been wrong. And you know, I think we generally speaking understand why that is. The electorate has changed and it's changed in part based on the candidates and uh, quite different platforms that the parties have and who's more likely to vote and less likely to vote. But it seems to me that these changes are potentially becoming uh, even more aggressive. And so my, my question to you, JT, is uh, how is polling changing, if it's changing at all? And how much credibility do we put into polls today? Should we put into polls? I, I'd like to you know, give the audience some tools to interpret what they are hearing in the media today and what they're going to be hearing in the media over the next three months. Yeah. First, I don't believe you should believe any one poll, right? I think you need to look at the polls in, in aggregate uh, and across a period of time and where the polls are trending. Because I, for one, have, have, have traveled the country for the last three months for, for a client of ours. And every, every time I go into these sessions, I ask the audience, how many people have been on the receiving end of a polling question? And out of 100, say, maybe two. So I don't know how they're getting a hold of these people. I know that the medium are, is changing, obviously, from home phones to cell phones. But who's going to answer their cell phone? 
uh, email, text. There are a number of ways to get to folks. And I, I'll have a question for Neil about the under 30 crowd, but, it, but you can't look at any one poll. I think you have to look at a series of polls over a period of time and look at the aggregate and look at the trends. The outliers, you know, you're always going to have some Democratic firm or some Republican firm out there. Um, I think there was one that predicted the Trump victory in, in, in uh, 2016, uh, and that was the outlier. Every once in a while, the outlier wins, but you, you do have to look at these across the, uh, across the board. I tend personally not to believe in the network polls. I love the, um, the Quinnipiac, uh, Siena, uh, those, those types of, of entities who I think are, are, are more focused on polling and the art of polling. And doing it right, I, I'm not saying that the networks have an agenda here. They probably do, uh, but I, I, I look at those polls. But again, I look at a series of polls uh, over a period of time and that aggregate, and see where that trend line is going. Yeah, and, and you know, my my question to Neil is this: When he's thinking about under 30 and where we're seeing the sentiment, how are we? How are pollsters actually getting a hold of folks, especially under 30? Uh, with difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> And and uh, and different people do different things. Uh, you know, some of these foundations like Pew can spend a lot of money, you know, calling people back again and again and again. Uh, calling back actually is important because you want to make sure that you're not just giving up on those people and that may skew the results. Right. But that takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. But let me say a few words in defense of polls for a second now that we've just been, you know, uh, busting them up. And that is, I do think that the results aren't that surprising when you look at the polls. I mean, let's look at the last two elections uh, in in uh, uh, Clinton versus tr uh, uh, Trump in uh, in 2016. Uh, Clinton was leading by a you know, around plus or minus three percentage points through most of those uh, last four months. And Trump came back and he won, but he won with a deficit of about two, you know, in, in other words, Clinton Clinton was leading actually in the in the final result by about 2% of the polls. And Trump just barely managed an inside straight. You, you remember the whole story yeah. of that, JT. It was about what, 1.9%? Uh, yeah. He was actually in deficit. He won the election because of the configuration of the electoral votes. So, you know, in other words, uh, Biden versus Trump. Biden was leading by somewhere around, you know, seven to nine percentage points through most of those last four months. And he ended up with a four and a half percentage point victory. Uh, in other words, those polls did tell us something about where we're going to end up. And right now, the polls look really good for Donald Trump. I'm just telling you, because right now he's leading by about three percentage points. And remember, you still have that skewness of the electoral vote. You got a lot of blue zone votes that don't matter in big states like Illinois and 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 New York and California, and uh, 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 Biden is going to have to get up, you know, uh, one to two percent positive over Trump to win the national election, and you can see that in the battleground states. Okay. I know you love to talk about the battleground states, yeah. JT. So you're going to talk about those. But I think it looks very really good. And I, I'm sure you've seen the, the uh, uh, latest results showing that uh, uh, a few states that actually didn't even seem to be battleground states are becoming that. Virginia, yeah. where I used yeah. to live, is yeah. now uh, only, what, three percentage points up so, um, yeah. for Biden, which is yeah. incredible, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so it looks good for, all I mean to say is to the extent that that polls do indicate where we're going in the last four months. It looks good for Trump right now. Um, so and, JT, what are the battleground states that you're seeing here for, for November? Yeah, and it's pretty much the same as last year. And that was the second part of, your, of, of my answer, Michael, is that don't worry about the national polls. I mean, you could, you could national polls, it's, they're trends, they're trend lines, but focus on the, 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 the states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, and maybe North Carolina. Although, although as Neil pointed out, Arizona was plus seven Trump last night. Georgia, according to uh, the, some recent uh, uh, polling I've seen, they're already making it like kind of like light pink right now instead of purple. So they're already putting it in the Trump Electoral College category. They're states like New Hampshire, Virginia, 
and Minnesota could be in play. Uh, but the, the top tier are, are what I said, especially the, the you know, the, what's really important, why that this Vance pick is is uh, uh, um, kind of uh, uh, strategically smart because neighboring Ohio, uh, neighboring Pennsylvania, my home state, and Michigan, not to mention Wisconsin, are all going to be fertile ground for Vance. In fact, I saw right before I logged on today, uh, dialed into this, I saw a piece where, and I, I think I tweeted this yesterday, Vance is going to camp out in Pennsylvania. They win Pennsylvania, it's game over. Uh, so, and and there's a, a lot of, you know, cross-border uh, appeal there uh, from, the, from the Vance side of things to uh, a, a segment of the population. So um, those are the states. And again, that map is expanding. And Biden keeps saying, you know, show me the polls, show me the polls. I, apparently they're not showing him the polls. <laughs> I um, agree. I agree with that. They're not showing him the polls because I, I don't get it. Yeah, I think anyone could. Show well, it's the same polls. people that told him he should debate Trump early on. Right. Yeah, the same people are right. So let's talk about Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania was the blue wall in 2016. Uh, Hillary Clinton never thought that she would end up losing Pennsylvania. Uh, is, is anything changing in the demographic or economic makeup of Pennsylvania, or does this really come down to dollars spent? Is is this just attrition warfare, financially speaking? Uh, you know, I, 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 JT probably has a better take on Pennsylvania than I do. Look, Biden has spent a ton of money on Pennsylvania and hasn't really moved the needle very much for him. Um, I don't know, JT, what, what are you hearing? I mean, uh, I live near Pennsylvania. I go up there sometimes. The part of Pennsylvania I see near Pittsburgh looks pretty red zone to me. Uh, yeah. But then again, you know, like all these states, you have the urban and you have the rural uh, and they're different worlds, right? Yeah. Um, JT, what do you see in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I mean, the, the, Michael, I don't think you've heard this before and, and probably some of our viewers have, but Pennsylvania is uh, Pittsburgh in the West, Philadelphia in the East and Alabama in the center. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so demographically, I don't think much has changed. I think uh, the current governor who is, you know, should there be a change in ticket on the Democratic side, and right now it doesn't look that way, uh, Governor Josh Shapiro, centrist Democrat beat the Republican by, I think, double digits there. So I think from a registration standpoint, it probably slightly favors the Dems. Um, and the, the, the Democratic turnout machine there favors the Dems, obviously. But remember what happened in 2016. That was a critical state uh, for Trump in 16. Uh, look where he was this weekend, you know, 30, 30 minutes away from my hometown uh, up in, 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 in Western Pennsylvania. Trump is gonna be spending more time there. Uh, uh, as I said, Vance is gonna spend more time there. As it stands right now, it's a true toss up state. And I'd have to say uh, that it probably leans uh, Trump uh, um, at this juncture. So let's uh, look at some of the Senate races then. What do you think the, the most interesting and, and bellwether Senate races are that you're watching? Yeah, so let's just start out of the gate where I think Neil is decamped these days of West Virginia. It looks as if uh, we are going to have a change already from a mansion seat, who's a, a blue seat, a Democrat, he's retiring, and it's all but assured uh, that Governor uh, Jim Justice will be the next senator, Republican senator from West Virginia. That's already one flip uh, for for the Republicans. So right now, as it stands, the Senate would be 50-50. Some of these races uh, don't really matter because they're going to be in, in royal uh, blue states uh, or ruby red states. Um, what matters is, is um, you've got a, a, another race in uh, um, Pennsylvania, uh, which is probably slightly trending Democrat right now, Governor Casey, uh, uh, Senator Casey, uh, you've got a, a, a race in, in nearby Maryland here where it's the Democrat is favored to win, but a former Republican governor, uh, uh, Larry Hogan, is in it and he's going to give her a run for his money, uh, for her money uh, at the end of the day. So that, that I wouldn't rule those out. You have races in Nevada, uh, which is a purple state on that, and she's going to uh, really struggle to hold on to that. Montana is a blue senator in a ruby red state. Uh, and that's likely uh, to flip, um, again, if there's a, a big trend here. And you also have a race in Ohio. Now that's the advance 
um, is, of course, the Senate, current senator from Ohio. Uh, but there is an open seat. I, I'm sorry. There is a Democrat in that seat right now uh, running in a very red state right now, now with a vice presidential candidate uh, on the ticket. And that's uh, Sh Gov uh, Senator Sher I keep messing that up. Sherrod Brown sure, is the right. current senator there. They're going to have to do everything they can to hold on to that. So the map, the Senate map clearly favors Republicans. As it stands, it's 50-50, and all the, the Democrats have to hold all the seats I mentioned, plus, plus one or two more, to maintain uh, uh, control. And it, it, it's going to be a hard act to follow. So our prediction is clearly the Republicans will pick up the Senate. Yeah, and and uh, obviously if the if they win the White House, it control almost automatically goes anyway um, uh, as a tiebreaker. But I, I would agree with you. Uh, Sherrod Brown, you would think, is the kind of uh, 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 kind of gritty, kind of uh, working class, uh, somewhat culturally conservative center. You think that would do well, right, uh, for the Democrats um, in Ohio? But he's up against an interesting challenger, uh, Larry Hogan. What has surprised me, and this is the different Trump, right? I think you're right. It's the different people around Trump, the different. Uh, personnel in charge of the uh, uh, Republican National Committee, particularly in charge of the Senate races. Um, and that is that Trump is actually backing Hogan against a lot of the MAGA type. You remember in the uh, when when Larry when uh, when Larry Hogan um, uh, 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 said was 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 quoted as, as something as saying, well, you know, we we should trust the result of the jury. <laughs> Do you remember that on the, with the with the criminal case? And all of these magas were piling on him, and Trump defended him. Yeah. Uh, very unlike his performance back in 2022 when he was always going with the more MAGA type. He's beginning to see that he needs these more moderate, uh, uh, you know, mo more moderate GOP candidates. Larry Hogan, it looks possible. I agree with you. Montana um, uh, is uh, uh, Montana is another one. Possibly even New Mexico. We didn't talk about that. Yep. Uh, Arizona is going to be a toss up. Uh, and, and Arizona, as well. yeah. Just, but the but the point is, is that that just to keep it 50-50, the Democrats would have to win all the questionable races. You always get a good sense of how difficult it is for the party by always looking back at the election six years earlier. Right. That was 2018 when the Democrats actually picked up a lot of marginal seats. They have to defend all those seats this year. Yeah. Michael, one third of the Senate is up every two years. Uh, the, the, the Republicans have uh, less ground to defend, 11 seats. Um, the Democrats have 23 seats. Uh, it's 34 this year, 33, 33, 34. And a lot of those Republicans races aren't even in economy. Texas, Florida, those aren't going to be contests. And uh, then looking at the House, um, where yeah, do you Michael, see the whole that? house is the the whole house is up for grabs. Of course, every two years, four hundred thirty five seats um, of those four hundred thirty five. And I love doing this with Keith in the morning uh, as we get closer to the election time, uh, and he gets it right. Uh, but of those 435 seats, truly 25 to 30 are purple or toss ups. That's what it comes down to. Everything, once again, ruby red or royal blue, and uh, they're baked in. And so it's going to come down to these seats. By the way, of those 25 to 30 seats, you have races, some critical races in California, uh, New York and New Jersey. So the House could be won, the Republican run House could be won by the Democrats in blue states that don't really have a say in, in the presidential. They're not really in, in, in play in the presidential. Uh, so just a, a little dynamic. You, you have other states that, that have purple districts as well, but uh, a bulk of these are going to be in those states. And I still maintain, um, because there are more um, uh, uh, Republicans, uh, they're, they're, they're Democrats trying to defend uh, less ground on the House side, I, I, at one point, pre-debate, thought the Democrats were going to take the House back. Uh, at this point, I think it's it's less than a 50 percent chance, um, especially if the, the trend lines and the Republican Party and Trump stay on this course. I happen to believe that if Biden stays in the race, though, uh, that all of his money will dry up. There, already, there are entities that are already withholding 
90 to 100 million dollars from the uh, Biden presidential campaign. I believe that that money would would gravitate, would flood to Democratic House candidates to try to get them to take the House to have a check on the Trump presidency. So uh, while I'm, I'm I'm saying it's it's likely to be a Republican sweep now, at some point I'll revisit it. And I, I do think that the Democrats are going to give uh, the um, um, the Republicans a run for the money in the House. We we did see in we did see in the last election, twenty twenty two, a number of flips in New York State. I mean, just an example of what you're talking about, where the Republicans actually picked up in a blue blue state. One of the things we often forget is that these blue states often have huge red zone areas. Uh, I grew up in California, and except for the coast, a lot of California is pretty red zone. People don't actually understand that, and these are you know areas that could easily flip. Uh, uh, and and you're absolutely right. Uh, that's that's where you have opportunities. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what you can say other than that, other than the momentum of the actual, you know, the actual race. Uh, you know, the, at you know at the top of the ticket. Uh, and to what extent that matters? How much do people flip? Uh, uh, meaning, uh, uh, you know, switch switch between local and, and national yep. you you see you know reports this. of that happening yep. but yeah i mean one of the things that everyone's noticing is a lot of these democratic candidates are polling a lot better than biden yep. the interesting question is whether they actually vote that way when they get into the polling booth one of the things that i've been tracking is the incidence of split tickets split it's ticket actually in. been declining over time Oh, yeah. And partly because of this whole polarized mood. I mean, if I'm a Democrat, I don't care. I don't care if you're going to hate the guy. I want that person to be on my tribe, right? Um, so we see a decline of split tickets, and it's going to be interesting to what extent people are going to split. And in so fact, let's circle back up to the tickets here uh, quickly uh, as we try to wrap this up over the next 10, 12 minutes or so. But, you know, a week ago, obviously, um, pre this weekend's events, uh, the president was under significant fire uh, in his own party. Obviously, events of this weekend have, have diminished that a little bit. Now the focus is on the RNC. Do either of you think that Joe Biden is not going to be at the top of the ticket for the Democratic Party at this point in time? You know, one one unfortunate result of uh, of the shooting uh, in in Pennsylvania is that it kind of closes down uh, the Democrat campaign for a couple of weeks, and almost everyone has sort of said, "We just got to give it a rest." And unfortunately, that gives Biden an opportunity to kind of what what I would call run out the clock. You know what I mean? If he's really adamant about keeping uh, his candidacy. They have to have a new candidate. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I've looked at some of the laws, JT. Uh, toward the end of August, uh, they, the states have to have a name to put on the ballots. And this is actually written into the laws of a lot of states. Yep. Uh, so you need to actually have some sort of process in place by which all of those candidates to the Democratic Convention can actually assess the merits of new candidates, vote on I, JT, do you have any opinion on this? Time yeah. runs out after a while by the time you get to the end of this month. Juan, you're right. Biden is trying to run out the clock um, at big time. And whatever movement, and I do truly believe that pre-assassination attempt that that the Democrats would have been successful at removing him at some point after the Democratic Convention. I think you're right in that the uh, that the assassination attempt put that on hold. Everybody is sort of holding their their oh God. I don't want me to say the word holding their fire uh, and keeping their powder dry. Shall we say? Let's use that term. Uh, keeping their powder dry for the for the for the time being. Um, but the unrest is still there. It, it clearly there is a, a an extreme discomfort uh, amongst many Democrats. Uh, with Biden at the top of the ticket. As far as running out the clock is concerned, um, the one hard deadline used to be August 8th in Ohio. Ohio required a, um, a, uh, 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 the, the nominees so they can start thinking about ballots and early ballots and all these things. Uh, so the Democrats decided to have this electronic roll call starting on, on August 7th. So they'd get it, uh, the nominees uh, to Ohio beforehand. I think uh, Ohio made a couple of changes so we might get over that. With that, I just heard overnight that 
there is a move from senior Democrats and Biden, the Biden campaign to start this so-called electronic roll call on July 27th. So they'll start the roll call on July 27th through August 7th uh, and just start moving, right? Just start moving and getting, getting ahead of the curve. Uh, but I do think that the only hope in replacing Biden at this point is that there is a convention bounce, and I predict there will be uh, for, for, for Trump. There will be a post-assassination bounce slight for Trump. <clears throat> and once he looks at these numbers, not the national numbers, but the battleground states number numbers, Arizona minus seven, Biden is down seven in Arizona. Uh, again, neck and neck in, 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 um, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, he, he was up a bit in a couple of these states. The, the polls are gonna show him down in almost all the battleground states. If they show him those polls and he stays true to his word and the powers that be prevail upon him to step out, there's still a chance he'll do it. But as it's with his rhetoric and his stance right now, it doesn't look like he's budging. But I would not yeah. rule it out. JT, the, the the polls in the battleground states haven't looked good for a while. And uh, the 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 New York Times Siena They're slipping poll, away. Looked terrible even before the the uh, debate. Uh, looked terrible in the battleground states for him. I, I don't know if that's going to change it. I, I just don't think he's listening or uh I don't know. I agree. So uh, then let's talk about the bottom of the ticket. Uh, obviously, the country has gotten to know Kamala Harris. Um, J.D. Vance is a much newer player on the national political scene. <laughs> uh, and typically, people don't vote for vice president. But in an instance where you have two very old folks running at the top of the ticket, the selection of vice president may be much more historically important than it has ever been. How important is the vice presidential debate going to be? And how important is it going to be beyond the battleground states to introduce the American people to J.D. Vance? Or is that just not going to be a focus of the Republicans because they just got to win those you know, handful of, of uh, battleground states to, to make this happen? Yeah, I, you know, personally, I, I think the, the Vance pick, as I have said earlier, is, is a really good strategic pick given Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Again, he's going to decamp for those states. And 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 just run hard. Traditionally, I don't believe the vice president uh, on the ticket matters. I don't think the vice presidential debate will matter. I do think there is a contrast, though, at this juncture. Policy aside, um, and there are stark differences in policy. Even though Vance has some interesting uh, uh, policy positions that are run counter to Republican uh, um, um, thinking uh, and Republican policy, there is unease with uh, Kamala Harris, even within the Democratic Party. And I think you'd, if you saw a stronger number two uh, on the Biden ticket, I think you would see independents and, and, and undecideds and even never Trumpers uh, uh, giving Biden a second look, again, pre-debate. Uh, but advanced ticket, it's a younger ticket, although it's all white male, I think it does help him uh, uh, strategically, especially in those battleground states. So from a campaign standpoint, it matters. He's younger. It's a youthful look. Um, and um, he's going to campaign hard in those states. And uh, um, I, I think it's a, a good pick. I think Rubio would have been a, a Rubio or maybe even Tim Scott. I think if they were behind or if they felt they were behind, would have been a, a better pick for Trump. But they know they're ahead. They feel like they're going to stay ahead. Uh, so this is more about cementing his legacy for the for the time come. We'll get into the policy uh, uh, um, applications in a second. I don't know if Neil has a, a word here or not. Yeah, I think there were some better picks for him. If they, uh, I, let me put it this way: I think, I think uh, J.D. Vance was chosen because he gets along really well personally with Trump, and he agrees with Trump on almost everything. Uh, and I think that's why Trump wanted him. Uh, I don't think this was chosen at all because of that would have helped them much on the ticket. J.D. Vance was not, you know, he didn't get much, a huge share of the Republican primary running in Ohio, and he didn't win by much. In other words, he's kind of an intellectual. He's, um, I, I don't know if he has a huge, strong resonance with, uh, you know, the, the red zone out in those out in those battleground states. Maybe. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think the debate actually would be very interesting between Kamala Harris and J.D. Vance. 
Uh, it'll be very snarky and prickly because uh, J.D. Vance is sort of this, um, you know, he's a kind of an Ivy League kind of guy and, and they're going to be, you know, trading stuff. It's going to be a very different kind of debate than between Biden yeah, and Trump. Sure. Uh, let me put it that way. But it's not going to change anyone's mind. No. Uh, and I do think that J.D. Vance, one thing that Trump really liked about him is that he represents in his policies, in his policy positions, the new populist Republican Party. It's not really interested in staying in Ukraine. He thinks 2020 was a stolen election. He's hugely invested in this populist theme about um, helping working class American. That's why we need a tariff. That's why we need, you know, all this stuff. That's why we need immigration control. It's to help working class men. In other words, this is the new Republican Party, JT. Yep. This is not, this is not Nikki Haley's party, right? This is not that's even right. Tim Scott's party. And, and I think that that's the statement that he wanted to make. Yeah. And I did just think about, you know, compliments Lena Khan at the FTC, partners with Elizabeth totally. Warren at times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, and he's, he's, you know, the business, I will tell you one thing, uh, the business community here in Washington, D.C., the, the business lobby here in Washington, D.C., is not happy with their pick only because of his anti-corporate stance. And that goes these back the, to these uh, are what they this is what they now call the conservatives, you know, the K.A.H.N. Yeah. conservatives. I love that. So, yeah. But but you have a lot of younger people. And actually, that resonates, J.T., with a lot oh, yeah. of younger oh, yeah. conservatives are kind of all into that. Against you know, the TikTok Khan ban. Is a, what? He was one of the few senators that voted against the ban. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're going to start wrapping this up here. Obviously, this is serious business, but uh, JT, I, I don't want to leave without a, a, an interesting story that you have to tell because you actually have a Secret Service nickname that I actually had to laugh pretty oh, hard. God. I was hoping you didn't do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've Back been up. inside a vice presidential campaign. You were chief of staff for Jack Kemp in 1996 when he ran with then Senator Bob Dole for president against uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Yeah. And uh, there was a campaign event and something happened. Yeah. Well, there's a better debate story, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, yeah. So there was a threat in the audience. Uh, and I was outside of the stage, and the uh, Secret Service guys came up to me and they said, We've identified a guy with a gun in the audience. And Kemp had this, he was just gregarious, just loved people. And after his speeches, he would just dive into the audience and shake everybody's hand, sign footballs, take pictures, what have you. And the Secret Service said, you get him off the stage. Obviously, our sites are trained on the guy with a gun. He's not holding it, but we see it in his, in his, his pocket. And just grab him off the stage. And Kemp would, wouldn't always listen to me. And so I ran up to the stage after the speech, looked him straight in the eye, and I said, get your ass off of the stage now there's a threat in the audience follow me to the door we walk toward the door as soon as we get out of sight of the audience the secret service pushes him it's sort of you saw a little bit of this on saturday they surround him pushed him through the door cast me aside and then you know end of story a couple hours later the secrets a lot of these guys became friends over over the years i went up to the guys and said you know, what the hell was that all about i mean you just tossed me aside like collateral damage. What, what, what's going on? He said, because you are collateral damage. You don't matter. And so all of a sudden, my nickname became collateral for a couple of weeks uh, after that. So it was not a, um, but that's how they operate. And I'm, I'm, I'm back to your original question. I'm, I'm truly surprised that there was a breach like that, given the, court, the, the extreme coordination, the Secret Service, local state police go through. It, 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 it's something that, I mean, if they can identify a guy with a gun in his pocket in an audience, how do they not see a sniper? J uh, JT, I, I have a question to follow up on that. A lot of, uh, um, I know uh, uh, the, you know, former CEO of uh, Blackwater, you know, a lot of people have kind of weighed in on this. And many people are wondering about the no shoot first policy of Secret Service. In other words, if you see someone with something that looks like a rifle, do you just shoot him? I mean, do you just kill him right there before he does anything? The reason why I say that is because clearly they they had him in the sights. They were trained on him. They were waiting for him. And once the shooting started, the guy looked down, looked back, and then, you know, took him out. And the question everyone is asking is, is there a no shoot first policy? 
Uh, that's a good question. I can't answer that, Neil. But there, there, there probably, uh, there probably is. Or if there, there is, they probably should eliminate it. If you see a threat, um, at what least, they should have had is someone on that roof to begin with. Well, one hundred percent. But also, if your sights are trained on them, like the guy said to me twenty some odd years ago, if your sights are set on them, at least try to disable them or. Um, a, a, approach. There, it didn't seem as if there was any attempt there. Oh, you know, uh, these are sharpshooters. These, the Secret Service and our military are some of the best gunmen and gunwomen in the world. And uh, you're telling me that they couldn't at least neutralize the threat if they're not. If the policy is no kill, why don't they, why not try to neutralize? Yeah. All right, JT, Neil, thank you very much. We're going to wrap it up here. I suspect that there are going to be more surprises that are going to be eyebrow raising for the three of us and our audience. And uh, we're going to probably reconvene in this group at some point prior to November. But thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, have a great week for everyone out there. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike.